Good evening and welcome to tonight's John A. Widsow Foundation virtual conversation, Church History and the World, Doctrine and Covenants 132. I'm Richard E. Turley Jr., your host for this evening, and I want to welcome our guest, Kathleen Flake, a dear and longtime friend who is the Richard Lyman Bushman Professor of Mormon Studies in the Department of Religious Studies at the University of Virginia. Before we get into tonight's topic, I want to mention next month's Church History in the World Conversation, which will focus on official Declaration 2 in the Doctrine of Covenants. That conversation will take place on Sunday, December 19th, 2021, and our guest for that evening will be Darius Gray, a well-known African-American member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, who joined the faith in 1964, several years before official Declaration 2 was issued, and who can give us a personal perspective on the impact of the June 1978 revelation on the priesthood. That should be a memorable conversation, and we invite you to join us for that occasion. I also want to remind you that previous conversations in this series are available at the John A. Witsow Foundation website, www.witsowfoundation.org. Tonight's conversation will also be, be available at that site in about a week. Now let's turn to the subject of tonight's conversation, the 1843 revelation of Joseph Smith that is now section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We'd like to remind you of the format for these programs. We will begin this evening with a discussion between Kathleen and me. I will give some background to get the conversation started. She and I will then discuss the topic. Meanwhile, we invite you as audience members to craft your own questions, which we'll begin addressing about half or two thirds of the way through the hour. You should be able to submit your questions to us on the software program through which you are listening. Now, let me begin with a little historical background, which I take from the Joseph Smith Papers website. Quote, Joseph Smith's first and only publicly recognized wife, Emma Smith, showed marked ambivalence toward her husband's secret practice of plural marriage, at times rejecting the doctrine and at other times reluctantly accepting it. However, by July 1843, the practice had become a major source of distress between them. In hopes of alleviating the tension, Joseph Smith's brother Hiram Smith urged him to dictate a written revelation to persuade Emma of the divine origin of plural marriage. The resulting revelation expounded principles behind both plural and eternal marriage, close quote. Now, Kathleen, you and I have been discussing this revelation for perhaps 15 years now, and in the process have realized some insights beyond those on which people traditionally focus. As we have come to recognize, this is a very rich section. How should students of this revelation approach it if they really want to understand it? Well, I can't answer that in the absolute, but I can tell you what's helpful to me as I have read it over the years. It seems to me that there are three things that the reader needs to bring to the text. First of all, they need to think in terms of the purpose of existence and not merely as moral refinement, but as spiritual empowerment. That, that the reason we're here according to Mormonism is to achieve a level of capacity, not only a level of morality to not merely be a good neighbor, but to have the power to engender life. And this is related to Moses 139, which we use in a number of contexts, but seldom in its original one. And that is when Moses asks God, what is the purpose of all he's seen? Why did you do this? He asks, God answers, this is who I am and what I do. It's what makes me God. This is my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of humanity. So his godness is defined in this term, in this sense of being able to elevate others to the quality of life which he possesses, which is not merely timelessness. All right, it has to do with his glory and his capacity. So I think that's the first thing you have to bring to this section if you have any hope of understanding what it's talking about. It's talking about our existence and its purpose. Secondly, I think you need to talk, you need to think in terms of kinship, not merely 
spouses. Too often we read this section as if he's only talking about husbands and wives, but he's talking about the broader sense of kinship, how people are related to one another. Let's not forget the ceilings were not only marital ceilings, they were adoptive. So that would be the second thing. Don't get distracted by thinking about spouses. Think about kinship construction, okay? And then finally, I think it serves us better as we read this chapter to see it as a priesthood chapter, as a priesthood section, that it's about priesthood, not marriage as we understand it. So those are the first three things I would say that if you bring them to the text, you'll get further in understanding it. Existence, all right, what are we here for? Second, kinship, not just spouses. And thirdly, priesthood, not just marriage. So then what does the text bring to us? I say, if you read it and you get stumped, it's always gonna be talking about one of two things. It's gonna be talking about the terms, or you could say the law, as the Lord does in this section, but the terms of the new and everlasting covenant. And again, don't just stop there. Note that the Lord says, it's the new and everlasting covenant for the fullness of my glory. It's the new and everlasting covenant, which is not just the restoration in general. It's, it's that part of the restoration that has to do with the fullness of his glory. And a useful definition of glory is God's power, right? When they behold God's glory, they behold his power, right, in the scriptures. And, and I think that's a handy definition. You can also make it more complicated than that. But this is, this section is devoted to discussing the ways in which you participate in the new and everlasting covenant for the fullness of his glory. And I could send you back to Moses 139 to get uh, the more particular definition of what that glory is, which is his capacity to engender life. But anyway, the second thing the section talks about besides the covenant, it talks about the failure to keep the terms of the covenant. And that's where the word damnation comes in, in relation to the cessation of progress, those who cannot enter into my glory. Okay. So it talks about the terms by which we receive of the fullness of his glory and the terms by which we fail to enter into that glory. And then these two themes, this is my, my final step. These two themes are then illustrated by two sets of people. The first one is Abraham and Sarah, the covenant made to Abraham and Sarah, which is the model for the new and everlasting covenant for the fullness of my glory. And the second couple is Emma and Joseph, specifically Emma's accusations against her husband and the state of their marriage in July of 1843, after they had been sealed in May of 1843. So this includes the counsel to them both. Um, and I think that's where I want to stop. I think if, Rick, if you want to go over any of that, I'm, I'm happy to, but sure. I'm ready to go to questions too. You know, for three and a half decades, I have pondered deeply about Joseph Smith and the life that he lived. I had access during 30 of those years to Joseph Smith's personal papers at any time, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. I could go into the church's collections, pull out the original materials and look at them, study them. And I did spend a lot of time on them, including uh, in my role with the Joseph Smith papers. And one thing that has occurred to me as I've studied Joseph Smith's life over a period almost as long as his life is that he got glimpses early of things that he then had to figure out how to communicate to members of the church. I, I recently was reading his 1832 history and I saw a phrase I hadn't, hadn't remembered seeing before in which he said that God opened the heavens to him. You know, generally, I sort of thought of the first vision as this little spaceship coming down or conduit, but not a parting of the veil. Apparently, it was a parting of the veil allowing Joseph Smith to see heaven. Of course, another revelation that we've studied this year, section 76 of the Doctrine and Covenants called the vision in his day, also gave him a glimpse. And it's fascinating to me that 1843, the year he got the revelation that's now section 132 of the Doctrine and Covenants, is also a year in which he essentially said, 
if you could glimpse into heaven for five minutes, you'd know more about the subject than all that's been written about it previously. So I think when Joseph glimpsed the next life, what he saw in many ways was a, a kind of series of relationships, kinship, as you ex expressed it, that he then was trying to create on earth as it is in heaven. And so um, in, in the Revelation, it's now section 130, where he talks about that same sociality that exists with us here will exist with us there, except will be coupled with greater glory. I think he was trying to say, that's what I saw there. So I really like this idea of kinship. Do you want to say anything more about that? Um. Well, what would you like? Me? We've talked about this a lot. We have. Uh, so it's easier for me to discuss it in the negative at first. Mm -hmm. uh, we, are, we today are really burdened by the notion of a nuclear family, even as we're rejecting it. We still think of it as, as a, a self-contained unit in which, uh, let's just talk about in the Latter-day Saint sense, in which rightly we understand that the priesthood is in the home and salvation is worked out within that home. All right. We don't usually think about it extending to others unless it's, again, that narrow line of the people who went before us and our specific posterity that will come after us in a kind of very limited DNA sense. But and that's how we imagine heaven. But of course, we also know that's not true. We know that that line that is so vertical in our mind from genealogy and from the way we romantically talk about the family, at, at, it's, going to, it's going to go horizontal, right? That we are ultimately going to be of the quote, same generation, that generation, if you will, that came to the earth, right? And that parents are brothers and sisters of their children and that, that notion. And so once you let go of that strict verticality and go horizontally, and you realize that, at least I think, I think that what we're talking about are not DNA connections. I don't think we are primarily talking about emotional connection. I think we're talking about connections of power and glory. Now that doesn't mean there aren't those other connections, right? And we know that the fruit of the gospel is always love. So I don't want to say there's no love in this, but the primary function of that chain is one of this, this dispensation, if you will, of glory and so what does that look like? Uh, I don't know if you want me to go into my little star chart there, but I think that, the, I think that, uh, what do you want me to, where do you want me to go, Rick? Well, I'm, I'll just let our audience know that uh, I visited with Kathleen in her office at the University of Virginia, and she's been playing for several years with a way of graphically depicting how all of this looks with families being connected in what, what's your, what you uh, might call a star chart. You want to sort of explain what that looks like? Well, I think, I think, for example, that at its worst, when we hear the family talking about, the eternal family talked about, it, it's almost as if every, you know, your children are bouncing, bouncing on your knees through the eternities, right? But that clearly can't be the case for the reasons I just mentioned, right? Um, in one sense, nobody is everybody's only child and everybody's everybody else's child. It's, it is this economy of engendering spiritual life. And so what, what I imagine, I, I, think, I think one of the ways to understand section 132 is to read uh, the, pro, the book of Abraham, not just chapter two, but chapter three closely. That very chapter that we avoid, it seems to me, almost at all costs, where Abraham sees the vision of the heavens and there's all those funny words and nobody really you know, knows what to do with it. And so we just kind of jump over to, oh, here's another version of creation and the pre-existence. But it seems to me that after Abraham gets that his vision of the heavens, and of course the, these are these heads of dispensations like Joseph, right, as you just described, have this vision of the heavens that are it is mo with greatest particularity described in the book of Moses by Moses in that encounter I just mentioned where he sees the world and God says do you have any questions <laughs> and anyway I won't go on with that but so 
so if we were to see that world ourselves, and, and I think Abraham, Abraham gets the picture that's worth a thousand words when he looks at the heavens and he sees how those bodies relate. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't see, think of those of you who know this, the Orson Hyde chart with the little crown mm -hmm. and then the lines coming out. That's the organization chart in, a cor in an incorporation, in a, in a temporal corporate design. Right, that works for the ecclesiastical structure that Orson Hyde knew, and I think that when Joseph was talking to them, that's how he understood Joseph's words. I think eventually what happens is, at least in Joseph's mind, when he's working with the Book of Abraham, that it's this understanding of the world like constellations, and you have bodies of different mass and energy and light, etc., and other bodies. Of varying degrees within the within the scope of their gravity. And that, and that in one sense, the God that we worship of this world, which is Jesus Christ, is one of those centers, if you will, of that gravitational pull of spiritual life that sustains us, right? He leverages us up through his atonement and his resurrection. And, and I think ultimately, whether you're the Relief Society or the Bishop of a ward, you have a similar, more, a similar function of that. I don't want to call it more concrete, but it's certainly more ordinary. As you're called to move about the ward and keep these people, if you will, in play, in, within the zone of a particular experience of, of spiritual well-being and growth. And that's the model not, not the, the neoclassical or classical great chain of being, and certainly not the children bouncing on our knees, but I think it's more what Abraham saw in that picture of people at varying degrees of difference, right, being sustained as they continue to progress. So I think what so, a lot that's of just, our- That's just what I think, I'm sorry. Well, I happen to agree with you. I, and I think many people who read section 132 think of it in terms of nuclear family. They think of a husband and wife being sealed, or in the case of a, a period in which plural marriage is practiced, a husband and wives. But I think it's it's really informative to think of it in terms of this kinship that you've been talking about. If, when I was uh, young, I got very interested in family history and later on had the opportunity for a dozen years to oversee the church's family history department. What I came to realize is that genealogy charts, pedigree charts, instead of going like this, they go like this for a short distance, and then because all these people are intermarried, they begin to kind of mix up. And I think that instead of thinking about a very neat pedigree chart, you know, that sort of steps out like this, we need to realize that all these ceilings that we're talking about begin to connect everybody who makes it to the celestial kingdom in one great big family. So that if, if I marry in the temple, as I have done to my wife, suddenly my family and her family are connected. And then she has a sister who married somebody else, and they're connected, and pretty soon we're all connected. And in terms of the next life, it's going to be flat, and we're all going to be connected together. Understanding the family in that way really creates insights for me when I study section 132. And I think also, I was in a youth Sunday school class today, and, and the teacher asked the question, well, why does the Lord want us to gather? And uh, nobody really had the answer. And I was thinking in my, the way I understand this, this is where power is generated, right? Mm -hmm. yes. Where two or three are gathered in my name, he says. Well, certainly when the entire human family is gathered together, that is a structure of glory, which is power, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So I, I think that that, that power that uh, we, we get cumulatively, we can experience in, in many ways on earth, but that sociality that Joseph Smith's talking about that exists in the next life is really going to give us a kind of, of power experience that we can't fully experience or even really comprehend in, in this life. So I think, it's, I think it's key to understand that. Let's talk about this... Uh, point you made early on about understanding the section in terms of priesthood and not just marriage. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, it says of itself that that's, if, if you look, if you take it, if you read it as a whole mm -hmm. and you allow yourself to actually outline it as if it were your homework, 
-hmm. you would see that's where it's going, right? It's talking about priesthood. And, and so in order for that to make sense, however, you have to understand what priesthood is. And we so often today are quick to say, well, if you think we're Mormons, you don't understand who we are. Well, you know, if you think priesthood is Melchizedek, you really don't understand what it is. You know, this is DNC 107, verse 3. Uh, it, it is the holy priesthood after the order of the Son of God. And, and I encourage the listeners here to go through the DNC and mark every time that word order comes up. And when he says in the DN, when he says in, in, uh, in section 132, he says it's a house of order, and he's talking about the laws that of this this um, this glory, this power, this introduction to this power, um, he he talks about it, be, it as people being ordered. That gets into the relational dimension, but ordering in relation to Jesus Christ, just like the name of that, just that's the real name of the priesthood. We are ordered after the Son of God, and so you'll notice. And I should probably go to my text here to demonstrate this, but. Um, when he, when he talks about the three rules for the practice of this, of this, um, this dimension of the gospel, he says, and these are, these are the three rules that come out of the book of Jacob, actually in the book of Mormon, but he says, all covenants, you know this, all covenants, contracts, et cetera, et cetera, any time of, of promise you make to anybody else is what it amounts to. Any promise you make, to anybody else that's not made an enter to and sealed by the Holy Spirit promise of him who is anointed. And I disagree with the footnote in that in the scriptures. I don't think he's talking about the, the prophet there because he's talking about the prophet in the next line. In this line, I think he's talking about Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit of promise of him who is anointed, right? Mm -hmm. Both as well for time and for all eternity. Then he says, and that most to most holy by revelation and commandment, through the medium of mine anointed, whom I've appointed on earth to hold this power. So that combination of him who is anointed in heaven, which is Jesus Christ, and the prophet on the earth, right? So this notion of, of this is about priesthood, about ordering us in a, as an, in, a, in a priestly fashion. So what is a priest? Basic definition of a priest is someone who mediates between heaven and earth. Right? Like a telephone mediates someone else's voice right now, text, whatever. But, the, but that machine mediates it. That's how I get, when Rick sends me a text, I get it through the phone. And, when, and there are certain things on earth that we only get through the prophet. And this is one of those things. And so, so a prophet is someone who stands between heaven and earth and, and has, okay, let's go to DNC 121. I love the phrase that they use. Uh, or he uses there, the rights to access the powers of heaven is what the priesthood is. The rights to access the powers of heaven. And so we are ordered in various ordinances to get various rights to access the powers of heaven. Okay, that you can look at these different, you can look at all the different offices, you can look at the different ordinances and they're not the same and see that each of those are designed to evolve you, to, to progress us in our capacity to work this glory, right? By giving us rights, not so much by giving us power, but giving us rights to access the powers of heaven. And that's the Holy Ghost. The power of the priest is the Holy Ghost. It's not the person who holds the priesthood, that's just fundamental. People hold offices, but the Holy Ghost is the power of the priesthood in my book, if you ask me. So, so these various ordinances give us those rights to access the powers of heaven, and all of them are encompassed with this, within this ordering that's called priesthood. So when you're married, you can go in and think that it's Disney Castle, and you know there's going to be birdies and hearts flying around you, but that's not what it's about. It's about ordering you in the priesthood, I think. All right? That's right. Why, why you go there where you do, wearing what you do, not tuxedos, right? And why, and, and how that ordinance works, okay? That you come closer, I believe, okay, don't blame anybody else. I believe that that ordinance is as much an ordination as any other ordination we see, because what an ordination does is order you. 
and you are definitely being ordered there at the altar in the temple. That is an ordination ceremony. We just, we call it a sealing, but it, but it ordains you, it orders you in relation to the powers of heaven, such that what? You get the capacity to birth people under the covenant. And what is the covenant? It's the, co the new and everlasting covenant of this ordering of the human race, which is the priesthood. So that, I think I have, I gone astray from the question, Rick? No, no, you, okay. you're right on top of it. When we're talking about the relevance of priesthood to this section, I'm, I'm reminded from my readings of the Old Testament, which we're about to study in our, Sunday, our Gospel Doctrine Sunday School classes next year. I'm reminded of how Moses leads the children of Israel out of Egypt. He leads them to a mountain, a holy mountain, the equivalent of what we call a temple today. And when he gets them there, they make a covenant, a covenant of obedience. They say that all the Lord requires of them, they will obey. And then they're happy to offer sacrifices because they've looked at their ancestors before them who offered sacrifices and think, okay, we can, we can live this law of obedience. We can live the law of sacrifice. And so Moses then wants to take them a step further and help them to be able to do what he is able to do, which is to pierce the veil and talk with God face to face. So he starts to prepare them to have that order of priesthood so that they can go through the veil and see God face to face, and they rebel. They decide, no, that's, that's frightening. We don't want that, and they don't make themselves worthy of it. And so they are then left with a priesthood, which is only, if you think of the priesthood as, as a whole, as a pie, then they're left with one piece of the pie that we well, today Well, they get what they ask for. Exactly. They get what they ask for, right? They say yeah. to Moses, hey, we've seen that mountain. That's spooky. You go talk to God. Come tell us what he has to say. And that's exactly what they get. They get messengers. This is DNC 84. That's what the ironic priesthood is. You speak with God's messengers, which is no small thing, right? Yes. But sure. it's not what Moses was offering them. And so the order of the priesthood with which they're left is the one that they practice in the tabernacle and then in the in the constructed temples that follow in Jerusalem. And all of the work that they do in there relates to those first two covenants. It relates to their obedience, it relates to sacrifices. And only one person is authorized in the model of Moses to go through the veil once a year into the holiest of places in order to commune with God. And so they, they got what they asked for. And the wonderful thing about section 132 that people, I think, are missing in all of this is that this is a section, as you said, that talks about kinship and priesthood in such a way that it makes it possible for people to advance in these orders of priesthood to the point where they can someday go through the veil and talk with God face to face. And that's a very powerful concept. And it, it, it reinforces this notion that is so distinctive about the Latter-day Saints that, that, that this salvation may be individual because I'm repenting of my sins, but after that, it is all communal, right? After that is about relationship. Well, I find it fascinating that in his final night with his apostles in the New Testament, in his great intercessory prayer, Jesus the Christ, Jesus the anointed, to reinforce what you said before, he specifically requests of his father that his disciples are, are able to become one with him and his father as Jesus and his father had become one uh, in, in their time together. Mm -hmm. And so, as you say, even though we focus on the individuality of it, when we get connected together in these huge kinship arrangements that then, then uh, pass into the next life, we're going to find a kind of connectiveness and a power with that connectedness that we don't have here on earth and maybe even have a hard time comprehending. It so really I, is, I'm sorry. Go I'm ahead, just, please. I was thinking, it really is such an extraordinary contrast between what we in religious studies call spiritual but not religious. This individualistic realization of your spiritual capacity could not be further from what Latter-day Saints believe. That's correct. And President Down H. Oaks gave a talk on the need for an institutional church recently yes. at General, General Conference. And he, he points that out, that while, it, while all of us enjoy solace from time to time by having solitude, 
And while there is inspiration in going out into nature and doing other things that we, we find quote unquote inspirational, you cannot achieve the level of spirituality that you have collectively by being within that new and everlasting covenant that's been restored and advancing through the various ordinances of it towards eternal life. You just can't get there that way. So let's, let's talk for a moment about uh, the meaning of the fullness of my glory. What does that mean to you to be able to achieve the fullness of my glory through, through these ordinances? I, I think that's Moses 139. Okay. So it's this the is way my work and my glory to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life. And immortality and eternal life aren't about time, right? Other sections of the DNC talk about my disciples didn't forgive one another, and that was the greater sin. And if they don't do it, eternal will be their punishment. And then he stops because he knows we misunderstand. And he says, oh, I mean, it's my punishment. Mm -hmm. It's not that it'll last forever. It's yeah. that it will be as if they have to atone, right? And so I think that whatever it is that makes God God, mm -hmm. whatever that is, and as close as we come to it, I think, in defining it happens in Moses 139, that generativity, right? And, and maybe, maybe the end of section 121, that everlasting dominion that flows to you without compulsory means. Forever I think that's ever. another insight into the nature of God. Yes, uh, that's that's what the ability to do that is what it means to partake of the fullness of his glory. Yeah, I think sometimes we try to comprehend the eternities in terms of the boundaries that we have here on Earth. So we are living on effectively on a line segment to borrow from eighth grade geometry. We have a beginning that we call birth. We have an end we call death. And we are on this one point wide time segment, line segment that goes from birth to death. And so we, we try to comprehend everything that's not bounded by our own bounded temporal existences. And I think that's where sometimes people get crossed up on section 132. I find myself gaining great insights when I start to say to myself, all right, in the next life, time as we understand it here doesn't exist anymore. And nor are there boundaries in terms of the resources we have available to us nor are there going to be ultimately boundaries on our knowledge. And if you think about those three things alone and what it might mean in the next life to be interconnected and have the blessing of being interconnected, I think, I think you can gain a considerable amount of, of insight. So I think when, I think the way to read, I mentioned that all of these principles are illustrated with two couples. Mm -hmm. So I think one way to understand that term would be to go back to the book of Abraham, chapter two, where the covenant of Abraham is described that will make him and Sarah, the parents of everyone who received this covenant, mm -hmm. right? So to read those sections, the promises that are made in Abraham two mm -hmm. are the promises of the ceiling, I think. Yes, they are. And when you, when you recognize that those are the promises and the blessings that come from the ceiling, that's quite a bit different from the way that we, we tend to uh, describe it and think about it when we're thinking about nuclear families and romantic marriage. Uh, we, we tend to think of it in terms of Hollywood parameters that may not exist in the next life and, and Hollywood ways of doing things. I've just pulled up a, a question. We have a a member of the audience, I'm going to put my glasses on so I can read this fine print. This member of the audience has written, if you are female, sealed, receive a release to remarry, but do not, I assume do not marry, is the first marriage void or is it still in effect as the second marriage didn't occur? I, I think one way to answer that is to say, if you are a woman who has been sealed and you receive a release to remarry because your your partner did not keep his covenants you your covenants are not are not uh, voided by virtue of the fact that he didn't keep his do you agree with that kathleen uh, i think i think that this question unnecessarily troubles us is what i think okay. i think okay. cancellation of sealings is a regulatory necessity in a large church Mm -hmm. 
but I do not think it participates in the constitution. I don't mean, I could mean it both ways. It is not, it is not part of the ceiling itself. Mm -hmm. I believe that the ceiling is broken by the people who make the ceiling, not by God. That God doesn't have to act. That ceiling is broken by how we treat each other. And so any woman who thinks she's tied to a wicked man just does, I just think doesn't understand what a ceiling is. Yes. And, and so, but the church has to, because of who we are as humans, right? And because we need another kind of order in this house, in addition to this glorious order I've been talking about, so that people know, same reason we wear wedding rings, right? So people know who's attached to whom, they cancel ceilings. And I'm not saying that they do it lightly at all. I'm just saying this is a regulatory necessity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have, I don't think, it it the the prophet is 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 acknowledging something that's already happened when when he cancels the ceiling i believe and um uh, i i could tell you i believe that but it, it, if you listen to the ceiling ceremony itself and you notice the relationship between the officiator and the parties who are doing the ordinance i think it's quite clear that the, that the bond is made by the two people who are acting as a priest and a priestess at that moment. If you consider you know, who they are, where they are, everything else about them, what they've been through to get to that altar, they are there as a priest and priestess and they make that bond and then God sanctions it, he sanctifies it. And that's what makes it eternal, right? But if you break your fundamental bond, then, we would say sua sponte in the law, but but it also says it in DC 121, amen to the authority of that, I would say, person. Mm -hmm. So if you've been a marri in a marriage where either of you have covered your sin or gratified your pride or vain ambition or exercised unrighteous, exercised dominion in the least degree of unrighteousness, bam, just it's gone there. Now it can be gone for a moment or it can be gone forever. I don't know. But I think it depends on the circumstance, and that's why the law is not susceptible to covering all these circumstances. But I do believe the general principle is that, that people are not bound to wicked people. That's just an absurdity, right? That's yeah. an absurdity. But, but we, of course, want, we want magic, right? We want magic as human beings. We want to control things. We want to say, gosh, if I go do that, then I am guaranteed of this. And the price we pay for it is these anxieties about, oh, maybe that really did bind me so much that I'm still stuck in it. But that's just, it doesn't comport with any other principle we know about God or his church. Sorry to get exercised about that. but So one way to think about it is that if we enter the temple and make the covenants over the altar, that promise us the blessings uh, that are mentioned in that ceremony is so long as we keep those covenants and have the Holy Spirit of promise confirming those to us, we don't need to worry uh, that the other person has violated his covenants or her covenants and, and that the Holy Ghost has removed its ratifying seal. An another way to say this is people can't lie their way into heaven. You know, if people lie to get a temple recommend, they, they lie to the their future spouse, and they they marry in wickedness. Uh, that that ceiling doesn't exist from the start, and uh, the the person who is not worthy doesn't have those blessings and will not until he or she repents. That's a more of a theological answer than than anything. Here's another question. Uh, comments on the evolving application of gathering now that we have the ability to connect worldwide on the web. I think this is going to what you said earlier about uh, how gathering together in in churches this person i think is asking is our gathering now not just physical but virtual well that we call it virtual i think is the answer to the question mm -hmm. this is a a wonderful um uh, this is a wonderful uh means by which we can stay in touch mm -hmm. but you can't take the sacrament over the web you know, you can't really serve one another as fully 
online as you can when you're sitting next to them or when you're visiting them in their home. So no, I don't think, I think the internet is one of those latter day necessities that I'm grateful for, but would, doesn't constitute the kind of gathering that the Lord is talking about. It's a gathering to the covenant technically, right? So yes, I think it does allow some, some blessings that people otherwise wouldn't have. For example, I was uh, speaking in a country where people were distributed so far and wide that they couldn't possibly get together on a physical basis every week, but the internet made it possible for them to hear messages that they otherwise would not have heard and even to participate by, say, praying from their distant venue in a collective meeting. But that's certainly not the same as the gathering that we're talking about physically. Here's another I question. Think, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I don't want you to think I don't think much good can be done online. But I think that what the Lord has in, in mind is something much more intimate, the way he described it in 3 Nephi 18. Yes, I agree with that. The next question is, what's the connection between the law, transgression of the law, except for murder and blasphemy, and the resurrection? And this person is pointing to section 132, verses 26 through 28. Connection between the law, transgression of the law, and the resurrection. You can see one thirty two twenty six twenty eight. Well, this is the section that talks about the straight and narrow, what, straight and narrow law of marriage. I I think the best way to understand uh, what destruction means is, uh, but they shall be destroyed in the flesh and shall be delivered under the buffetings of Satan unto the day of redemption. And so, who's the figure that illustrates this? It's David who violates his covenants. Mm -hmm. And therefore, like we mentioned before, will have to do for himself in some fashion that we don't understand what the savior does for those who, with a broken heart and contrite spirit, bring their sins to him, mm -hmm. right? So I think that's what's going on there. And what happens to them in the day of, of resurrection, I don't believe we're told, but evidently there is something between what happens to those who, who crucify Christ afresh and are and volunteer for out of darkness, a place of no glory, right? Those, those guys who say, give me no glory. And then the people who came really close to the line by violating their covenants of this straight and narrow law of marriage and will have to work out their salvation, but will participate in glory. What level of glory, we don't know, and whether there is an end to progress in that, we don't know. None of those questions are answered. Okay. This listener writes, you mentioned three rules for practice of celestial marriage. I only caught the first one. Please repeat them. Well, it has to be, it has to be revealed by the Lord. And it has to be uh, licensed by the prophet, right? Mm -hmm. And then the third rule, it's not really a rule, it's more a definition of what it is, which is to say it has to be, it is for the, uh, the uh, raising of a righteous generation. And again, that word righteous is not a reference to moral righteousness. It's a reference to those who are born under the covenant. And in virtue of having been born under the covenant, think of Israel here. They're a royal priesthood. They have the right to access the powers of heaven in virtue of their birth. And that's the righteous generation he's looking for, a, a generation that's ordered in the priesthood so that they may, exercise, they may access these powers of heaven for the salvation of the world, and in this case, for the preparation of the Lord's second coming. Otherwise, otherwise as Moroni quoted uh, from Malachi, the world would be a waste of time. Thank you. This audience member writes, generativity versus stagnation is the seventh of eight stages of Eric Erickson's theory of psychosocial development that leads to ego integrity. Expand your use and definition of generativity. Well, I have to take your word for it because I haven't studied Eric Erickson and this and uh, but yes, you could think you could think of this in terms of uh, the integration, uh, the achievement of whatever we think the integration of. But it, to me, it's more existential than psychological. 
I always want to leave open, yes, there are temporal manifestations of this, and we through our sciences can see parts of this, mm -hmm. right? But there's also this part that's much more difficult to see, if it's seen at all, which is what, what the Lord would, would define as our ultimate potential in terms of being able to be an instrument of the immortality and eternal life of others. Yeah, I, I think that, you know, going back to Christ's great intercessory prayer and his, his call for oneness among his disciples, oneness with him, oneness with his father, when we really do understand section 132 and everything that it means pertaining to kinship and priesthood and so forth, then we are going to align ourselves and what we do with God's work and glory as well. So it, it doesn't, we're not piggybacking on, on top of something that was, is done by others and just riding free and, and gracefully and quietly and pursuing our own hobbies into heaven. We're, we're getting there by aligning our will to the Father's and doing what he does and what his son did. And also, and I'm sure you, you mean this too, Rick, but it's a grace. It's yes. a gift of God. It's not something you, you work your way towards ultimately. You, you do the things that make you eligible for the gift. But the gift itself is something separate than what you are able to accomplish for yourself. And that too may differ from what you're thinking of in terms of psychological uh, exercises that we do to heal ourselves. So... It's only through the grace of God that we're saved after all we can do, to paraphrase a, a portion of the Book of Mormon. But I think sometimes I, I see people who are acting as though they can go about their daily life, do whatever they want to do, spend their time, money, and other resources the way they want to. And so long as they have a passport with visas stamped in it, they're going to make it into heaven. And I'm just suggesting that it's, it's more complicated than that. It's not just getting a visa with... Uh, for a particular ordinance, it's a matter of aligning your will with God's will. It's a matter of aligning your purpose with God's purpose and doing what he's doing, not just pursuing whatever you want and then writing into heaven on the grace of God. <laughs> That's what I meant. I would, I would say that the key difference in those has to do with sacrifice. Yes. That alignment takes place in the course of sacrificing, and then the gift can come. But I think we're getting off topic, but it, that in itself is a great topic. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the member of the audience who asked the question about the second ceiling that didn't happen has a follow-up comment and question here. Referring to the second ceiling that did not happen, since women can only be sealed to one man at one time, so the release was given, but the other marriage or ceiling did not happen, Am I now considered sealed and able to obtain the celestial kingdom, or do I have to wait for a future sealing to obtain the highest degree? If so, if a spouse is unfaithful so the sealing is not bound in heaven, does the faithful spouse obtain the highest degree, or will we be given to a worthy spouse at some future place in time? We, we don't have answers to, to that. Uh, we only have our logic which can fail us about spiritual things, religious things. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, but I, I suppose this is one of those places where I would say, and it's just one of many places where you have to go back to what you understand about the nature of God. What do you think, what do you think God would do for you based on what he's done for you in the past? How would you imagine his actions towards you would be? And we do know that his stated purpose is to exalt you we do know he's committed to accomplishing his purposes. The mechanics of how that happens, we just have the barest glimpse of, right? We have the barest glimpse of. So I think you understand your situation best. You know how God has dealt with you. If you want more, more concrete data on that, then I think you have to go get it for yourself. But the church itself, the church does not doesn't follow all the permutations of where this can go wrong or even where it goes right when you think about it it really stops at the altar in many ways and then you are then you go to the scriptures where i where i pointed you to the book of abraham and to the doctrine and covenants and all of that but 
I just, I, I think you have to satisfy yourself about such an individual question. Though many people share, appear to share your situation, no doubt all of you have a different, would have a different take on what happened to you. And that's the kind of individuality the Lord promises you in your own personal spirituality. Thank you. We've got a listener here who asked the question, can you show the star schematic? <laughs> I don't think I can. I don't think I can share my screen on this. I've thought about putting it up on my website, but it needs too much explanation and I never have time to write the explanation, so. Okay. Uh, the next question is, can you talk about the relationship between polygyny, polyandry, and the law of adoption? How are they different? How are they related? Well, polygyny and polygamy are, are uh, technical terms that, that the early saints who practiced their form of family life refused to use. They talked about plural marriage. I think there they were trying to signal that it's many marriages in one. The second distinct, and that's different than that, and I understand that technically polygamy means many marriages uh, as opposed to polygyny, but I think that they were trying to, to speak in, they were trying to transliterate polygamy so people understood the equal dignity of all these marriages in the one kinship structure, right? Mm -hmm. So I think that's one thing that's going on. As opposed to, was polyamory on the list? Polyandry. Polyandry. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, I, I, I think that uh, scholars who, who, who look, for example, at, at Zina, Diantha, Huntington, Young, <laughs> wherever you want to stop with her names. Jacob Smith, yeah. Yeah, um, that, and try to make that, polyandry are looking at a ceiling as if it's a marriage and that's a problem they don't allow for the the differences in those relationships so i don't i don't subscribe to oh well, this is a whole other conversation i'm thinking about william law's conversation with emma where he says, she said, we resolved it in terms of equality, right? I think that's, I think that's really dangerous to think of equality as sameness. And I think that's what's going on in the tussle among these words. They're trying to think, they're trying to say, well, are women equal to men? And, the, and that just invites another question, equal as to what, right? So, our, and really what, what I, people end up arguing about are, is are women the same as men before God? And is it possible to be different and still be equal, right? That's, that's, the, that's the question that's going on behind this wrestling about terms. And were some of these women acting like, uh, the, acting as heads of, of, may, of households with many men? I think it's clear they were not. I think that many of these women had multiple relationships and we're missing how fascinating that question is and why they're aligning themselves as opposed to marrying. If we could just drop this word marriage from this whole conversation, I think we'd, we'd get more light about it. If you could for a moment, just bracket your idea of romantic marriage. I'm not sure that's possible because we're just awash in it. Um, if we could just bracket the word marriage and come up with other words for what this thing looks like that they're doing, we would understand it better. So I, I, I I don't know if that, I hope that gives you some uh, different viewpoint on the question, but the question is phrased is difficult for me to answer because of my viewpoint about it. That it's, that it's a conversation that masks another question. Thank you. The next question is, how do we read the threats to Emma as coming from a loving, loving heavenly parent since she did likely understand the marriage covenant as massive creativity, why is the revelation so coercive in tone? I don't know why they think Emma understood this. That's my first point. Okay. Um, I, so that, that's, I'd have to go through each of those assumptions or assertions before I could probably adequately 
uh, answer your question. More generally, uh, whatever God is, he's not a teddy bear. So a lot of these questions but have a view of God that I don't subscribe to. I think God is a God of judgment as well as love. And that's one of the things that's truly uh, uh, omnipotent and omniscient about him that they, he can hold those two things in one place. Uh, so even when he, and the, the Beatitudes, when Jesus says, be ye therefore perfect, even as God is perfect, he's talking about because he causes it to rain. Remember, they live in a desert. I wonder what sort of state president today. See, even when people have trouble, God rains on them. So, no, they live in a desert. And, the, and what, what uh, is going on there is he says, he, God causes it to rain on the just and the unjust alike. So I have no doubt that he rained on everybody in Nauvoo, that he, he did everything he could to promote growth. But that doesn't mean that they were all just. It doesn't mean they were all doing what he would have had them do in that circumstance. So I, I think that's a danger when we look at that relationship with Emma and Joseph, right? What was going on at that time in July of 1843, right? That marriage was under considerable stress to put it euphemistically. It seems to me they were both ready to give up on it, but that's just me looking at that history, right? They both felt betrayed by the other, it seems to me, right? This is not, uh, so, and I think you see that reflected in that revelation where he's saying, where God is speaking to each of them in their own situation. But I don't think he means that he, that he loved them any less as he's speaking to them. And arguably he loves them enough to tell them the danger in which they had found themselves. We're just about out of time. We can answer one, maybe two questions if we do it concisely. This is the next one. The concept of priesthood that seems to unify sections 121 and 132, as you point out, goes beyond the narrow categories of Aaronic and Melchizedek authority and performances. Do we just need a broader perspective or is another kind of fundamental rethinking in order? Oh, thank you for this question. <laughs> If I could shout anything from the rooftops, it would be, we have got to stop confusing office with authority. Those are two different things. And as Joseph F. Smith said, when at a time when the, when the 70s and the high priests were fighting about who was greater, right? This is in the early 19th century. He said, their, their authority is the same but their offices lie in different directions. And I think the fundamental problem we have is we have come to identify office with authority. And because women do not have offices, it's assumed they don't have authority. And recently, several of the brethren, not least the prophet himself, have spoken out against this idea, saying that women have authority, that authority is linked to this order, but we do not know exactly how to articulate that authority. And so dare I say, this is just me, when I read those Relief Society minutes, I think one of the reasons is Emma didn't make offices. Joseph instructed her to do that in the organization meeting and she did not do it. And I often wonder how the church would be different if she had. Let's just, there's one last question I wanna be sure we get to before we wrap up and we're almost done. This question is, Section 132, verse 64, the use of the word destroy seems so harsh. Can you explain it? Also, why only a woman will be destroyed, not an unbelieving man? Why the greater burden and punishment on the woman? Well, I think that's where you have to see the historical context of this. She's accusing him of adultery. Just pure and simple, that's what's going on here. And the answer you get is, is down in the end of that section that um, he hasn't committed adultery because he's observed these elements of the law. Whether you believe that or not, that's what the text is saying here, right? That Joseph had not committed adultery. And so it goes through, there are the, he adjudicates, this is beginning in verse 41, I think you're talking about, the different kinds of marriages the adulterous sealed marriage, the adulterous temporal marriage, 
the unsubstantiated accusation of adultery against the wife, right? Those three circumstances. And then in verse 45, he applies that law to Joseph and Emma, right? So he says, I've conferred upon Joseph the keys and powers of this priesthood, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And saying, so he is one who holds these keys and he has not committed adultery in the way he's exercised them. But he is telling Emma, someone who has been sealed four weeks earlier, right? May, June, July, six weeks earlier, around that, right? Because this is middle of July. Six weeks early, she has been sealed and she's taken her position with him at the head of these sealed couples. And because she is accountable to the law, right? Or because she has received the law, she is accountable to it. And that word destroy is referring to that circumstance with David, I believe. This is just my interpretation. When, when that earlier question about how do we understand this word destroy, it has to do with David, quote, working out his own salvation, whatever that means in the next life, right? The kind of, the way he had to come to terms with his relationship with God that was going to, that he had to, he had to accept a burden that those who repent, do, those who can repent of certain kinds of sins. But David too had risen to certain levels and that's why he had cer a certain level of accountability. And that's what's being said to Emma. I don't think it's saying that all women have a greater burden than all men because that, that's why he goes through these different kinds of marriages, right? Where different people commit adultery, male or female. But the marriage he's looking at right there is a marriage where the woman is accusing the man of adultery and God is saying no. He hasn't committed adultery. And the woman is wrong in this. And if she's not careful, and it's not just that one thing that she accuses him of. I mean, this has gone on for three years, at least three years. Polygamy has been an issue in the church arguably since the translation of the Book of Mormon in, in 1829. And certainly by the summer of 1830, when he's translating the, the Old Testament. You know, polygamy it has been a part of, of the internal conversation of the church. And I would say with Emma and Joseph, because I don't know of anything that they didn't share. She was his peer in all things. Um, and so what you're reading there is, is that, that revelation that Joseph dictated on the night that Hiram comes to him and says, look, brother, my little brother, Emma and I are just like this. I know if you give her a revelation, think of all the men who came to Joseph and said, give me a commandment, give me a revelation. So if you give me one of those things that you see in the DNC, I know, I know I can help her understand this. And, you know, Joseph said something like from probably from your lips to God's ears, but he just, he knew enough that he made two copies of the, of the revelation. So then when, when Emma in her rage burned it, we still have it. And I don't doubt that she was very mad about this. It's not easy to read the last part of that, but that is a comment on their personal relationship that to some extent in the earlier verses when he describes the law, talks about the law that he's applying to her. And I just think we do her a disservice when we don't recognize that dimension of her life as well. Thank you for joining us this evening. It's been a stimulating conversation. We want to particularly thank Kathleen Flake for joining us and participating this evening. We want to thank you as an audience as well and invite you to revisit tonight's conversation and previous ones by accessing the John A. Widsell Foundation website, www.widsellfoundation.org. Thank you for listening and good night.